Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I've sent a, a, a biography where you could maybe cover, you know, 17, 18 minutes of the info, just talking about how great I am and stuff like that. I like that. <laughs> I mean, that's hard not to. It's hard not to. Yeah, so we have, we have lots of people here right now, and it looks like uh, it looks like people are chatting a little bit. This is a, a uh -huh. different platform than we've used in the past. It's a it's actually like a podcasting platform, but um, it'll, oh. it's, it records a little bit nicer, and it'll allow us to, it'll allow us to chat, and people can chat in. Um, so I encourage everybody here to please like chat any questions you guys have. Russ and I can see all the questions that are being chatted in. Oh, cool! Everybody can, yeah, everybody can call in if they like. So if somebody wants to wants to call in and you know talk, it's it's effectively like they can join right now. Um, yeah. So it's it's what it's nice about it is that we go you know there's effectively like a lot of times in these AMAs uh, it'll be you and me talking and then there's a whole lot of other tiles or what uh, in this way to sort of work. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wanted to I'll introduce Russ to everybody here. Um, a lot of you guys know, a lot of you guys have been on an AMA with Russ before. Um, anybody that, that hasn't, uh, Russell and I know each other, I mean, it's been, I think, 12 years, maybe 13 years. I can't remember. Oh, we've been no. close, closer to 20. So, okay. Yeah. It's, it's been a while. No, it's been a while. I just look really young. Yeah. <laughs> well, you still do. <laughs> um, but when I, was, when I was a new agent and didn't really know, I mean, much about much, I reached out for us, like a lot of people do, and just said, hey, how do you help me uh, become a really successful agent? And and what I was really asking was like, tell me all your advertising secrets. And, and you kind of cut through all the BS and said, no, like, this is less important becoming a good agent. You kind of, you really coached me along over the course of a long time. Uh, they said, so we become friends. I consider you a mentor and you always give great advice. And that's kind of where we're, Thank we're thanks for us for being here. My pleasure. So what what prompted me to reach out to you again, I'm going to reach out to all the time, is you have as one of your taglines, but uh, I'm not bragging, I'm applying for a job. And mm -hmm. I know yesterday we talked about a lot of really interesting things, but I didn't know if you could maybe start by explaining, what do you mean by that? Like, how would you, whenever you would go into a listing appointment, what, what would you do necessarily to qualify yourself? A lot of agents have a hard time talking about themselves, and that was that was what I got it. Well, one of the things is that line was in my, uh, and, and it still is in some of the ads. But it was it was a tagline we put in the ad because uh, I would go, I've sold this many homes, or we sell ten times as many, or fourteen or eighty times, whatever the number, what number it was many homes a year as the average agent or something like that. But but rather, because if you just go on talking about how awesome you are, it's a complete turnoff. Right. So I thought just I would soften it and go, I'm not bragging. I'm applying for a job. I want to be your realtor. Right. And, and where I got that idea, there is a man, his name is Robert Hanf, H-A-L-N. And he, I think he, at one time, he had the largest employment agency in the United States, if not the world. And he wrote a book called The Robert Half Way to Get Hired in Today's Job Market. And I was a member of some book club and didn't cancel the damn thing fast enough and wound up getting the book and reading it. And I thought it was an extremely, this is, I don't know, 30 some years ago, maybe more, maybe closer to 40 years ago. But what I was, thought was interesting is the parallel between what he was saying, here's how to get a job, where he's talking that if you want to go work for, I don't know, Motorola or, you know, whatever company, Anywell or something. Uh, he was saying, here are the things to do and here are the things you don't want to do. And I thought that was just exactly the same thing as that I was doing when I was asking people to list their house with me. Right. That I was, in fact, applying for a job. And it was if I took it kind of literally of going, here's my resume. And uh, so and, I, and I'll come back to that part on the resume. So whatever, like I might be talking to someone who's been in business, let's just say, 20 years. And or someone else is on this call and they've been in business one year. And you might be thinking, what do I say? Well, I'll start with you say the truth. Like, pretend like you're lying for a job somewhere. You're not going to want to make some misrepresentation. But there are advantages if you're a new agent that you can stress. Like, here's the, here's the deal. 
whatever you've got going, if you're part of a team, you want to tell people that's the most important thing in the world as a, because you should hire us because I'm part of the Rigsby team or whatever the hell it is. But let's say you're with, uh, I don't know if I was talking to someone with Remax, I, I would tell them you should say you should hire me with Remax. We have the largest international referral set up in the entire industry or whatever the situation is. You take what you have and say, that's what's a good thing. That's you should hire me. If you're an agent by yourself and you're new, let's take that one. Well, that's the very reason to hire you. You don't have that many clients and you're going to work harder than a regular agent who has a lot of business is going to work to get their home sold. Take whatever you've got and you explain what you have to offer as though it's the biggest, most wonderful benefit in the world. If you're short and fat, that's the reason they should hire you. I, I'm not making a joke here. Well, yeah, you yeah. take whatever you have and you... Like one, one time, a guy who's he's been with me about, about 24, 25 years, and this was, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, and he said, we need to change everything. We need to start doing what Callaways do, because I've lost two listings this month to them, and I, I just think, I don't know, it's just we have to switch. We have to start having open houses, which I don't do. We have to start doing this. He had this long list of crap that I thought, I'm not doing any of that stuff. And I said, well, let's just talk about this. And I said, have you ever met Joanne Calloway? He said, no. Now, J.C. was about, I don't know, even she's about six, three, six, four. Paul, broad shoulders, slim, very fit looking, wears monogram shirts, Alan Edmund shoes. Joanne would, if you said she, she's passed away now, but it, it, she was one of the top agents here in the Valley, looked like she came off an Illinois farm, which is exactly where she came from. So no one would have thought, that she's kind of a clothes horse. Really? And the point I'm getting at, Joanne was short and heavy, and I said anyone who would list their house with Joanne wouldn't list their house with you anyway. And anyone who'd want to list with you wouldn't want to list with her. And he said, why would you say that? And I said, because it's the truth. It's the truth. People, you're thinking, oh, well, you've analyzed this, and here's what they offer, and they got two listings. You don't know the ones we got. They didn't get them, for starters. But that's not really the point I'm making, sir. The point is, is that all decisions that everyone makes, i make that even a little more sweeping by emphasizing it again, all decisions that everyone makes on what car to buy, which agent to list with, what brand of shoes they ought to wear, whatever the hell it is, they'll pretend to themselves that they made the decision based on logic. They'll pretend like an engineer. Oh, I know. I analyzed all the cars, and this one's the best. I'm sorry. And I suppose you analyzed all dogs before you announced yours is the best dog. The breed of dog you have is the better type of breed for dogs. You, you, but you get where I'm going with this. My really? son is the best kid. Other ch children are split. They may be really cute kids, but they're not as neat as my kid. All decisions a person makes are made based on emotion. This isn't a theory of mine. This is an established fact. And so you, you could find people with political views, and you could go, you couldn't possibly have reasoned yourself into that belief. It's, it wouldn't be human. There's no logic system on, in the universe that someone used to go, here's why I have these beliefs. They were based on emotion, and you'll see some people, and the stupider they are, the more they'll claim that they've used logic to arrive at this crap. But that's not my point. So there's a certain percentage of the public, and this is one of the things, you could go on these listing appointments and you don't get the listing. Good for you for not getting that one. You went. The only stat I would ever be monitoring would be how many listing appointments did you go on? When I hear agents, and I've heard a lot of them say stuff like, I list over 90% of the appointments I go on. I go, really? Can you count at all? Or do you just enjoy lying? Yeah. Uh, people who make those kind of statements 
either don't go on appointments unless they can call the person and say, you promise you're going to list tonight if I come over. Yes, okay, I'll be over. Or, or something like this. Because the truth is, if I took the times when we were, if I said we were going on thousands of appointments a year, my team and I, if I said, but for 15 consecutive years before the run-up in prices, we averaged between 56 and 58% success at the table on appointments. So out of every thousand appointments, we took five listings, sometimes as many as 500. Maybe. You understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. And I've had people say, oh, I could help you with those. No, you can't, because I know how to count. If we showed up and they let us in, it counts as an appointment. We either walked out with a signed listing or we did not walk out with a signed listing. Now, when someone says, do you believe in a two-step, it doesn't matter what I believe. You don't determine whether it's a two-step or a one-step. The seller does. If you bought a seller who's a high D bottom line type of person, they don't want you to come back. Show me where to sign now, and they don't want, they don't care where you're from or you love your aunt. They're not interested. If you get someone who's a high S on the disc system, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? They actually want to know that stuff. A high I would be you have one of the really expensive watches, and a high C wants all the data imaginable, yes. and they will always want you to come back. That they're going to take, they have to think it over. But the point I'm getting at, those are all emotional responses. Every last one of them is an emotional response, and you don't control their emotions. So, so far, does anyone have any question, anything, anything? The questions have been predominantly uh, based around how this applies to the new buyer's rep agreement process. Uh -huh. That we're to follow. If everything's approved, which let's just think, let's just say that it'll be approved similar, it'll be at least on a similar form of what of what was. Yeah, what, yeah. Uh, yeah. So a lot of agents that work primarily buyers have not had to have these conversations in the past, and they've not had to have mm -hmm. you know anything signed until it was time to make until it was time to make an offer. And at that point, when you're making an offer, the the focus is not on you. The focus is not on the commission at all. So the focus is on, on the property. So mm -hmm. I talked yesterday about fear a little bit and yeah. and, and how that will oftentimes eventually it has to the problem with the buyer's rep agreements for some for some agents. And when you're discussing it, I mean, you're talking about the listing appointments, you're very comfortable. You've talked about this. You've talked about would you mind like could you could you talk about no, I want to make this all about what <laughs> your people like the, no no not know what I want what would I I want to take every fearful idea that everyone's listening, and I want to help you get rid of the fearful idea, period. So let's just take that. It's like, am I an expert on the buyer-broker agreements? No. You personally, Eric, know far more than I do about them. I don't even bother reading that stuff anymore. I'm not trying to, this is not some prima donna thing. I, I don't personally work buyers. It's going to change for me almost nothing. Right. So I'm, I don't have this in my bit listings. My business has been listing-based for at least the last 25 years. And so I, this is not something I'm going, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Well, when we do work a buyer, we're going to have some written agreement. That's all. But, but you go, it, things have been changing constantly. It's just not this way on that issue. The original purpose of the MLS was an offer of commission. That was the actual reason it was for. Uh, that that's being taken away, I think, is, you know, do I think the lawyers that represented the NAR, or the nicest thing I can say about them is they're idiots, uh, to have let it get that far and have the lawyers, who, by the way, are probably charging around 33, dick around with, oh, you guys are getting way too much money. Yes, it's awful, isn't it? But so, I just want to take this and put it in perspective. But... I don't want to ever try to work on things that are out of my control. So let's start with that. So I don't think I have anyone here today. Yes, I actually personally set up this whole thing with the NAR and the lawsuits and so forth. This would be like saying you're, you've been controlling the weather. So you might have had a picnic planned, and now it's raining. Well, have it inside or have it a different day. I don't know what else to say. Right. And don't work on stuff you can't control. Well, let's take the emotion of fear and let's make a little scale. 
Let's put zero at the bottom and four at the top. And I'm just going to run through some emotions. That, this will actually work out mathematically, by the way. So four is enthusiasm. Three is cheerfulness. 3.0 is conservatism. 2.5 is boredom. These are emotional responses. Two points is an agonism. One is anger. Point zero is fear. Is grief. Is apathy. And zero is death. Someone is on that scale all the time on every subject. They, they have an emotional response to it. Now, when you get a person who's obsessed with dying, or other people dying, or someone might have died, or they drive by a, a graveyard, they start being sad for soldier. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it re-stimulates them. Like they drive by a graveyard, no one's buried there that they know, but they've got a deathfulness sorrow about this and grief equality. That just means some old incident has gotten re-stimulated that they can't see. And they will invariably find something in the current environment to make that feeling make sense. Of course, it has absolutely nothing to do with what re-stimulated it. Nothing. If it did, they could easily spot what it was exactly, and they wouldn't have the fearful or deathful feeling anymore. So when a person says, the reason I'm Bob, the one reason of all possible reasons in the universe you can be certain are not the correct ones, is the one the guy's saying, here's why I'm upset, if he just keeps on going. Because if he spotted why he was upset, he would simply stop being upset. Well, let's go back to this buyer-broker agreement. And let's make a couple of sweeping statements, like, let's say, what does a good parent do for their child? They make the space safe. They make a safe environment for the child. That's the most wonderful thing a parent can do for their kid. Put a period at the end. What does a statesman do? I don't know. Let's take, for example, during World War II, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, during World War II, made it possible for people to have sort of a faith in the future with his leadership. He was a statesman at that time. People can go right in like that. Yeah, I'm not saying he was a perfect person. That's not my point. But you, when you get someone who's lifting others up, and making the environment safe, no matter what. Now, you get social, uh, sociopaths, some politicians, some people in positions of authority, that make the environment seem dangerous and fearful for people. That's what the lawyers who sued the NAR in these little copycat suits have succeeded in doing, is scaring the hell out of everyone. That's their actual product. They're going to get paid handsomely for doing it. But that's what they actually succeeded in doing, is making everyone like, oh, my God, the real estate business will be wiped out. Really? So people won't need to live somewhere anymore? All the home builders will stop building because of a commission issue? Like, right. No. It'll, I, I don't want to pretend I can say, here's how that's going to work out and all. No, I, I, but I don't, it's not, that's not what's important. It's going to work out. And we can say, well, here's how it might look for the next 90 days or the next six months. Uh, well, how about the BA buyer? I, I don't want to predict here's what's going to happen on that. I will a BA buyer get it unless he buys directly from the listing agent. I don't know. That's, but that's not something I want to work on. Because I don't think that's what's important here today. I think there are a lot of people far more qualified than me to talk about the nuances of what might be happening. You're one of them, Frank. Let's, let's look at, here's what's happened, is you have agents who have gone into fear at 1.0 on that scale. And when a person drops down into fear, you can oddly switch the subject sometimes, and they're still in fear. High volume fear would be terror. Low volume fear is worry. That's it. Just low volume fear. I, I don't know. Is this going to happen? It might happen. It could happen. I'm not sure if it might happen. When a person sticks saving, so a person in really, really, really good shape would fixate their attention or unfix their attention on anything they wanted to. When a person cannot unfix their attention, like they're obsessed with subject X, doesn't matter about sex, they can't stop talking about it, they can't stop thinking about it. 
they're not in very good shape, but not because the subject is sex, because the subject is not relevant to the statement I'm making. When they can't unfix, that's the whole point, when they can fix or unfix their attention at will, they're in really good shape, and if they can't unfix their attention, it wouldn't matter what the subject is, you could take sex, death, and money and go, well, a lot of people are upset on that all the time. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Therefore, they don't seem crazy because both subjects, everyone else has common agreement. You know, that's, people are always worried about that. But switch it over to, I don't know, gravel in your driveway. And some guy goes, yeah, I stay up at night and I keep a gun handy because I don't want someone stealing uh, the gravel out of my driveway. You see, that's so different than what the neighbors are concerned about. He seems crazy. Right. Only because he picked a weird subject that doesn't have broad agreement to worry about. So the people who are most worried about the NAR settlement are real estate agents who work buyers. There's no other class of person who goes, I don't know what we're going to do. But the MLS people, let's say they work for your MLS. They, they work at the MLS division, with that company, whatever, Houston's or whatever. That, that doesn't matter. It's, it's, they're not concerned about their jobs. Their job isn't going away. They're going to just take commission out of the listings. They're going to take it out of the forms. They're going to take it out of the things. So the people who work on the forms, well, this is easy. We just take it out. Now, does that mean commissions go away? No. It just means they can't be put in the MLS. That's all it really means. I want to make that statement. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't pay a commission. If I go to my seller and I say, here's how much I'm going to charge you. And if you really want to get top dollar for your home, you're going to need to pay X amount so I have enough money to put in this listing. And then we're going to, you're going to, we're going to put in the list. I'm just going to make this up. We're going to put the buyer's commission under closing costs and offer it to people as soon as they call. Yeah, we'll pay that. We'll give you two and a half or three, whatever. Whatever you could, no one can tell me what I can pay someone else for a job. No one has you. You can't tell BMW. You can't keep charging these high prices for those cars. I mean, you get the idea. Yeah. They can charge any price they want. They have a legal. It's the whole point of America. Right. The country that way. So as long as they're not trying to trick other people and keep prices artificially high. So the, the commissions are not going away. And it's not exactly news that the seller winds up paying them. People I've heard for years, well, the buyer really pays them because the seller would get, wouldn't get that money unless it came from the buyer. Really? Well, how about the for sale by owners? Does any appraiser anywhere in the history of real estate ever Take into consideration a commission when appraising a house. I've never seen it on those forms. The answer is no, they don't. So commission is paid by the seller. If the seller could successfully sell his house for the same price without an agent, he saved the money. It's nothing to do with buyers. So, but this doesn't mean the buyer agent doesn't deserve a commission, but you're going to have to be, I don't know, you're going to probably wind up having to call each listing agent, if I had to guess how it plays out, and ask, what are you offering? If I bring a client on that house, what are you offering? It's That's some, what's going to change. Well, it's, I mean, I don't know if it'll be that fragmented necessarily, but, but you and I can guess at, at how it's going to shake out, you know, for an hour. We can we can come up with different things. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't really matter. If I had to guess, uh, you know, there would be a field that allows the seller to advertise closing costs. And then everyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone will say, oh, well, they're advertising, you know, 3% closing costs. Yeah. We know that'll pay. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, yeah. I mean, in, in your scenario where you, where you have to make a phone call before you show a property, I mean, that's annoying, but it doesn't put anybody It's out. very annoying. I, yeah. I, but I, well, here's, here's my real point. That's what, if I look at what's really important here, it's not how the mechanics of that will play out. I'm not debating, like, you could go, right. I think, no, I, I agree with you a, million, a million percent. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's what the real issue is. If you are an agent and you are fearful about your future as an agent because of the rule, there's the problem. Just, just fear. Having fear. If I said to you, 
you could make a decision about the future. I rattled off tone levels from apathy up to enthusiasm. And there's more, lots of them in between, but I'm not going to try to cover all those little issues right now. I just want to get a broad spectrum here. When you make a decision, if you're madder than hell, it sticks. When you make a decision when you're enthusiastic and cheerful, it sticks. When you make a decision in apathy, it sticks. When you make a decision in grief, it sticks. The only point, if I had something, if I could teach one thing, is learn the emotional tone scale, that'd be one. And the second part is don't ever make a decision that's important. Don't ever make a decision that's important when you're low toned. Right. If I could just teach one thing to someone, that would be the thing. You just make all of your decisions. You just say, well, what if I'm upset? Well, get on upset before you decide something. Do something. There must be something that cheers you up. Walk your dog, pet your cat, go get donuts. I, there's something you do. For some women say, I like to shop for shoes. Go get some. Go right now and buy some. I can't afford it. If you sell enough houses, you can buy all the shoes you want. The only point I'm getting at here is do not make important decisions when you're upset. That's the only, if, there's, if, there's a, if there was one little piece here, like get in a good, cheery mood. And here, here's a little trick. And this is so silly. It's, and everybody sort of knows it, but I don't know how many of them use it. If you start smiling, quite literally, if you start smiling, just force your body to smile. It tricks you and your, your system into feeling happy. Like you can literally, like there's you, the identity, the awareness of awareness unit, which is you. There's your mind, which is this giant collection of pictures, most of which you can't see. And there's your body. If any one of those three is affected in any way, it affects the other two. You can take control of your body and the, which kind of pictures are coming in on you by simply forcing your body to smile. This is Siri. You can test this out all you want. Make yourself smile. And the next thing you know, you can feel in a cheerful mood. Yeah. It's that simple. And I'm just saying, if you did that, you did before, like, like, let's just say, what's the most important part of the real estate business for an agent? Like, it's more important than all the other things combined, and that would be lead generation. Nothing compares to the ability to lead generate for an agent. Nothing. So here's a little trick. Before you lead generate, this thing that is the most important, like, I could talk to anyone and say, well, do you think there's something more important than that? Well, contract writing. Really, I think you could go get somebody. In fact, you could hire an attorney. If you sold enough houses, you could get a, get a young attorney out of law school and just say, come with me everywhere I go. And don't say anything. I don't want you to talk. I just want you to show up. And everything that has to be filled out, I'm going to hand it to you. And you fill it out. Now, but but I'm not. I'm being silly on purpose. But you could do that. You could get an attorney that didn't have a good job somewhere for seventy, maybe eighty thousand pops. But but they're, some, but they're smart. They know how to fill out everything. The only point I'm getting at is you can get yourself in a good mood and then do what's important. You can control your emotions. Sometimes you people ask, "What makes you happy?" Make a list of things that make you happy. Literally, write them out. Well, I love petting my dog. I love holding my baby. I love doing blah, blah with my son. I love taking my daughter to the skating rink. You can make this list. I really, really do this. Make a list of things you really love to do so that whenever you think, you go, oh, I, I could do that. And have a number of them, different things, because they won't each one work every time. You could wear it out, so to speak. But the point I'm getting at there are things you do in your life that you just go, oh, God, when I'm doing that, I'm so happy. Well, what are those things for you? Do some of those and then lead generate. And you, you get what I'm saying. Just do some, get yourself in a good frame of mind and then lead generate. When you make decisions about your future, if you're sitting around going, oh, my God, well, it's this new rule means that or this. 
I'll go broke. You're a, you're the one deciding. I'll go broke. Don't make a stupid decision when you're frightened. Don't do that to yourself. You're the one. You're the decider. Remember that time when Bush said, "I'm the decider." It's like that. But he, what the point is, you get to decide all the attitudes, all of the attitudes about every single aspect of your business. So let's start with something like. Well, I don't know, you could take this new buyer broker form and you, you're, let's pretend they make a rule in Texas that you have to have it signed before you can show the house. I don't know. Let's just pretend. I'm just for the sake of conversation. I have no idea which rules are going to be made. That's not even the point. You could just decide for yourself. It's going to be so much fun learning it. It's going to be so much fun getting really good at getting people to sign it. I'm going to have a ball and I'm going to make a small fortune by learning how to get people interested in that form and how it benefits them. Right. That's all I'm saying. And you can, but these, these are decisions that you get to make and you can pull yourself out of fear. If you look at, like one time, I, I, if you looked at, if you took any aspect of your business, like let's pretend, because if you're in fear about the business and let's pretend that you're fairly young, when I say, I talk, I'm 78, so I'm not fairly young. I just look really young now. People look at me, well, you wait about 35, 40. But, but the point I'm getting at, let's, let's say you're young enough where someone would, or you would think, well, I really have my whole life ahead of me. Let's just take it like that. I have the bulk of my life as industry. And let's say you treat your real estate business like this, what you're going to do, working there in Austin, Ramlet Residential. It's what you're going to do the rest of your working life, period. How would you treat? Here's a form that now needs to be signed. If this is what you're going to do forever, would you go, oh, God, I, I don't know. I'm like, you just go once I suck, you know, I, 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 my broker over the years, we, I, I, I'm, I'm a broker, but I've never been the broker for the big company. They, they come out with we need this form signed now. Okay. We, we have to have this on everything we turn in. Uh, we have to have it. Okay. Do I ever go, I don't think you see, I don't care what I think. If the broker wants it, but we do it. Right. I don't even, it's not even something I, I remember one time I had an attorney working for me as a buyer agent. And he just loved to argue about crap. And our broker at the time said he needed this uh, roof rat addendum. And, and Joe goes, I, I don't think we need the roof rat addendum. I think it's already covered under the spuds. And I said, no, but Jim wants it. And he says, I, I, I fight him on that. And I said, I, I'm not fighting my broker on a roof rat addendum. If it makes him happy, I, I mean, it's just that simple. It's not, I'm not giving in. It's more of a like, it's his He's the one who's deciding what forms we need. And later when he said we don't have to have it, we stopped using it. But do, do I have a quarrel with my broker wanting to protect themselves legally by saying our lawyer says blah, blah? No, I don't even want to chat about it. I just go, yeah, we'll get the form signed. This is like that to me. Yeah. You get what I'm saying. Like, stop making it serious. Like, this isn't like, oh, my God, this is going to be change everything. No, it'll only change the things you will decide it's going to change. Otherwise, it doesn't have to change a damn thing. You can decide, I'm going to make more money because of this. And I'm a buyer agent. And don't ever take listings. You could make any decision you want to. Questions? Anything? So... I think the point of oscillation, right? The last time, the last time we met for an AM, they gravitated towards lead gen, which is mm -hmm. I mean, really insightful. And, and, and you tend to talk about lead gen a lot. It's something I learned from you pretty early on. That if you focus on lead gen, you can make a lot of other mistakes and they're not yep. that impactful. Those are kind of, things will kind of work out if you have lead gen. There you go. Talk yes, about it all the time. And you also mentioned that you feel like it's a blessing uh, whenever you like lose a, a listing like you didn't you didn't necessarily you didn't necessarily lose it you had the you had the bet i'm sorry you got the benefit of losing it because that person wasn't wasn't a fit yeah 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 i feel like the fear here from buyers agents is that they haven't had to have these conversations up front uh, a commission mm -hmm. conversation and to ask for any 
And if so the perspective yeah. is that they don't lose any, any buyers. And now they're fearful that they'll lose buyers whenever they say, Hey, I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get paid 3% on, <clears throat> on this deal. Can you talk to me about why you like losing listings? Like why, why it's a benefit? Yeah, to yeah. You? yeah. 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 So let's go back to, and thank you for that question. Let's yeah. go back to, um, we, over the years, listed 56 to 58 percent and i kept meticulous record of, did we go did we get a listing on that appointment and i've had people say well i could help you with those percentages i'm thinking no you can't i know you can't and you don't know what you're talking about here's what makes those numbers even more fantastic those people called us i didn't call them they called me and that was still our percentage at the table so when we let that sink in because we were heavy on radio and television, and these were people that called us asking us to come out. And those at the table, our success rate, our batting average was, let's say, 56. If I wanted to average at 57, that's what we would win. The rest of them we didn't get. And you go, well, don't you feel bad about not getting those? No, I don't feel bad about it. The purpose of a listing appointment was not to take the listing is to see if I wanted the listing, and then could I get it? What if the seller's psychotic? I mean, seriously, or oh. the seller's a lunatic. Uh, do I want that? I don't want that listing. I have people say, what do you say? What difference does it make? Leave. Get the hell out. And they go, well, how do you tell them you don't want it? It doesn't matter how you tell them. Say, I have to go to the bathroom. Say anything. Get the hell out. If the seller seems like a lunatic, so let's say you're a buyer agent talking to a prospective buyer about why they should sign that form, and they start explaining, I don't want to sign it, I'm not going to sign it, and you can go screw yourself. Do you really want that guy as a buyer? Right. I mean, seriously? Have you done something in some past life where you're trying to make up, make amends now by taking crap like that from lunatics? But you get the idea. Right. If I tell you is an actual percentage, the world is full of nice people, and that percentage, by the way, of the good people is approximately 80 of the people in the world have what called a social personality. They like to help other people, and they have a concept of exchange. 20%, or about 1 in 5, is a troublemaker. About 2.5% included in that 20 but the hardcore wackos, and they keep everyone upset. And that's where wars start all that crap from the crazies. So there's, there's a point here where I think it's important when you're going to look, go look for customers, you want nice people. You really want nice people. And if they demonstrate to you that they're not a nice person, the one thing you can trust them on is when they're behaving that way. So I'm not talking about Somebody who's on chemo, you just got a hold of them, you know, they just came home and she, no, ah, no, 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 they, I, they can say any stupid thing they want. I don't care. I, I've been on chemo. I get it. No, I'm sorry they feel bad. But when someone's just an asshole, why, in the, why, why would you ever want their business anyway? So to, I consider it, this goes back to your question here, sort of a lucky break that they identified themselves right up front. Right. Up here's someone who will make your life a living hell, only now you have a signed agreement to, to be a fiduciary for them, to put their interest above yours. So let's take those if I go from the seller and go, I don't want to make that agreement with someone I don't like. And let's go back to an office as a buyer. Same deal. I don't want to make an agreement like that with someone I don't like. If the person is a good person, I don't care how late they call. They could call at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night, and nothing's too much trouble to take care of a client. But if it's just some troublemaking loon, I don't want their business. And if happy they might buy a house, I don't care what they do. They're not doing it with me. And the sooner, and go back to if you knew you were going to stay in business the rest of your working life, how would you behave? What would be your rules for who's an acceptable customer to you? If you have that mentality that you're just scramble and take any deal from any customer, no matter how crazy they are, no matter how much crap they give you, I got to say, you need to change your mind about that. Right. This is because here's the thing. 
if I said that when you're if if you're if you feel uncomfortable around everyone, now the problem is you. Let's say you feel comfortable around most people, but when you're around some people, you feel kind of weird. Your attention goes off of them onto yourself, sort of wondering what they're thinking of you and do they like me? Blah blah blah. You get what I'm talking about? Yeah. There are people that, when you're around them, make you uncomfortable. Don't take them as customers. Here's what's actually happening. So let's go back to that tone scale. And I said those, those numbers for those different emotions would work out mathematically. The furthest you can be apart on a tone and actually communicate with someone is one full tone, like the distance between three and two, between two and one. So let's say. Two is antagonism, one is fear, anger is one. So you could be at two, and they're in fear, and you can still talk. If you're in enthusiasm, and they're in fear, you are not. there's nothing you're going to say if you stay in that tone. Their, your communication will not be real to them, and their communications would not be real to you. To actually effectively communicate, one full tone's the, the furthest apart you could be. High toned people pull low toned people up. Low tone people pull high tone people down, and the higher the person is on the tone scale, the more mobile they are. The lower the person is on the scale, the more fixed they are in that tone. So low tone people tend to pull high tone people down. So when you find yourself feeling really weird or uncomfortable around someone, it's because you've dropped in tone by being around them. That makes sense. Yeah. So. I, if I were helping someone, that's one of the first things to teach them. Well, notice who you feel better around and who you feel less better around. Just, just you don't even need to know these numbers on the scale. But that wouldn't be the important part of I got to memorize the numbers. No, you don't. How do you feel when you're around them? Better or worse? But whoever are your close friends, you're very close in tone. Whoever are your close friends, your tone, their tone is very similar. That's why you're friends. You're real. You understand that that's yeah. what makes it possible to be friends with them. So this, but, but if you find yourself around certain individuals, and it's a repeated thing, not everybody has a bad day. I'm not talking about that. I mean, nobody arrived. This is not, I'm always in a wonderful mood. That's fantastic. I don't believe them, but nevertheless. <laughs> but when, when it's a chronic thing, there's an acute tone or a chronic tone. When a person's always bringing a down, I would say you don't, you don't want them as a customer anyway. And I hope this is all making sense. Any questions on anything I've said? Anything? It, it makes a lot of sense, Ross. And I think I think that this whole situation will probably be a silver lining for a lot of agents. Um, yeah, listing agents certainly can identify most jerks at the at the kitchen table, right? When you're giving a presentation, yeah. uh, right. Buyers agents, I, I talk to them all the time, and you'll hear some of the effect of, you know, I've been working with these guys for six months. They're driving me crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've sold <laughs> 70 properties. And, and it's because mm -hmm. you go into the situation, you haven't had to ha have a hard discussion or ask them, uh, you know, if they're willing to make a commitment or something like that. And then you find yourself right. later after spending all this, after spending with mm -hmm. I know that I, you know, what do I do? I mean, that's really just an observation. And I think, I think, so where am I going with this? No, you're making a stupid point. This, what you're saying is really important. And it's the key to this. Like, why do listers get really good at asking for the money? Because that's really what they're, what you're getting good at. Nakarel is going to say, so buyer's agents, the benefit and the easy part has always been, you never have to ask, hey, Correct. you pay me 3% to do this job. So you don't I'll, have to ask anybody for anything. You can say, hi, I'll do all this stuff for you, and you don't have to pay me. It's like you're getting someone to work for you for free. Isn't right. that awesome? Right. Well, that's what's gone, going away. Right. And it's going to eliminate. Let's go back to the person who's been working the same buyer for six months, shown 70 houses. And I, I, this is not unique to the Austin area. Just so you know, oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> all over the country, and be blessed. Well, what would you do? Well, would you handle that? I said I would refuse to show them any more houses. 
well, what if they lose them? I, I, I want to lose them. I, I, I want to lose them. It's not what if I lose them. I, I do everything I have to to lose them. Well, what if they buy one a week later and be the total effect of a, a person who's already established they can't decide anything? That's what, what I know about that, that particular client you've been working with. They can't make a decision. I know that. Your time is worth zero. I know that. They think it is, and they've convinced you it's worth nothing. So do I think those are enhancing viewpoints for an agent? No, I don't. So if I said any time you find yourself or someone's making you feel less than you are, bringing you down, either avoid them, learn to handle them, or cut the line. Get the hell. I don't want them. Like you may have a relationship with someone in your family where you go, I can't just cut the line. I get it. Thing. And there are things you can do there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this call working on that. But there are things you, well, you can do stuff where you handle them and you don't have to be the effect. Like I could tell you a couple of things. Don't ever drink alcohol or take any drug or anything like that when you're going to go see them, ever. Don't ever show up hungry. Like you go, well, it's, we're going there for dinner. I'll repeat what I said. Don't show up hungry because if you're low blood sugar, you're going to regret it because they're going to make you feel like shit. So yeah. all, all I'm saying is you, and, and the other rule would be don't talk ever to them about anything that matters to you. Don't tell them about your goals, your aspirations, what, what any talk about the news some crap you could do, you know, it doesn't matter. Pick something that has nothing. You don't care what they say. If you love Obama, don't say it to them. If you hate Obama, don't say it to them. Don't tell them any opinion you have about anything that matters. That way they can't turn it and use it against you. Right. Those rules, don't show up hungry, don't be high, and have your body rudiments in. They don't mind what I'm not kidding on this. Well, there are ways to handle those people. But if it's a customer or a potential client, it's a simple handling. They don't want your business. Because literally, you'll make more money. In fact, if you went home, like the guy showing houses, they showed me 70 houses. I would tell that guy or that woman, why don't you take the afternoon off, go home and watch television? No, no, don't pretend to work. Because that's what you're doing. You're pretending to work. Go watch, get the show, or go to a movie, and that way at least you would know what you were doing, wasting time. Got it. You would, you, you, when it comes to business, you, you wouldn't think, well, by watching this show, I'm enhancing. No, you would at least know what you're doing is a complete waste of time. Showing those people, there's this pretense that it's work, and it's not work. So, it's cream. And so here's the here's the silver lining that I think a, a good buyer's agents are who don't have experience working listings will learn about this is that whenever you get objections to this form, this buyer's web agreement, it operates as a very good, we always called it a jerk filter, right? And whenever, mm -hmm. whenever somebody would push back and say, you know, we would tell them, Hey, okay, well, our fee is fixed. Here's that paragraph. And then they would try to negotiate the commission. There's a point where we say, look, that's, that's what we charge. And mm -hmm. if they don't want to sign it. They don't sign it. Uh, we call Redfin a good jerk filter for a long time because Red, they would right. be, is it good or Redfin? And they they will do it for that price and they're uh, yeah. to do that's that's one of the main questions that, that we get whenever you're presenting for for tenants with buyers rep agreement and you're going to mm -hmm. very, uh, say I'm going to earn three percent two and a half whatever it is whatever it is you start and they say no I want you to do it for will you do it for one and a half how do you respond to that I actually would have a slightly different approach the first thing I would do so let's talk about commissions in general mm -hmm. I would think this would be no different than the rules I have for uh, listing commissions or a buyer commission it would depend and the first rule I have is make all of those decisions when you're not talking to a buyer or seller like do not make it under pressure I yeah. sit around and think to yourself, so I have a rule that I will not make a lower commission for a jerk. Like someone who's being an ass is not going to get me down because I would feel like a hypocrite if I gave a better deal to somebody who's an asshole than somebody who's real nice and doesn't debate with me on commissions. So I, I just taking that so I whatever I'm going to give to the guy who's grinding me, from my mind, I'm saying that needs to be my number for the guy who isn't grinding me. 
for right. me to feel okay about it. And I don't ever want to make a decision like that under pressure. I don't make that decision at the kitchen table or the dining room table. Make it before you ever go. Once you've made it, when someone says, I would never cut the commission, I go, well, then, okay. I don't believe that. I mean, I don't. First of all, let's say I'm doing it for someone who's a friend. I mean, really like a family member, my sister. Right. Would I have a special agreement for her? Oh, hell yes. You know, we have friends that we just go, oh, my God. Yes, well, I don't know what I'm doing. In fact, we have an ex-agent. She was with us really, was nine years. We loved her. We, we would have kept her forever. She moved back to Ireland. And then she had two houses here she needed to sell. One that she was around. And she wanted to know what we would do. We're going to do it at a real good rate on the listing side. Because uh, we love her. It's that simple. And then pay a regular co growth commission. And she's sort of thrilled, but I thought, but, but we loved her. She was just wonderful. And we, we just, we hated to see her leave, but she wanted to go back to Ireland to be with her mom. And so I tried to tell her how great we were instead of her mother, but she, she was a bitch. And yeah. so we were, that's why we're mad at her, but, but you understand. So I, I, I don't have a one size fits all. No, no, no. And we have, we have customers that have been, oh God. Like if we're normally charging, say, 5%, and we have somebody we've done 40 deals with, I'm not exaggerating, we sell their houses for them for like four and a half, where we take two and pay two and a half. Yes. And we, we, so I don't have a one-size-fits-all. No, I, 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 I have a set fee. We yeah. have a great, we have a set set, set fees. But do we make exceptions? Yes. So sometimes you've got to repeat customer. We have one guy, I can't say his name, I don't mean it's a secret, it's, it's impossible because I can't pronounce it, he's Chinese, and it's a really long name. What I remember, is we're, we're close to 60 or 70 deals with that guy, and he, uh, the first, one, first house he bought was like, back during the horrible pricing, and it was like, it was less than 40000 he wound up. We do a we wind up just by have this one agent that's done all the stuff with him. Do we does, does he get special treatment? Yeah. Because he's a repeat client. When we sell him one, we get the full commission. But when we we sell one for him, we give him a reduced commission. Right. So I don't know. I mean, but he's in trouble free. And so yeah, we we'll do whatever if there's some reason to do it. I see if it's just like, hi, I'm an asshole, please give it to me for less. No. That yeah. would be the, the answer. So yeah. I hope I'm making sense there. Well the latest more based on so it's, it's not a cut and dry answer, um, because you do have to take into account different variables when you make the decision. Mm -hmm. you, you have to be pretty quick at judging character, you know. Yes. Uh, and yes. And how they ask for the reduced commission. One, I think that, I think agents will be pleasantly surprised at how how infrequent it is that people yes. ask for the reduced yes. commission. I mean, I, I'm purely guessing probably less than twenty percent of the time somebody. Yeah, would... but that's that magic number, about twenty yeah. percent are troublemakers. Yeah, that's and then and count then... on it. <laughs> exactly, and, and you've heard. I mean, whenever you've never met someone before, you you just talk to them for an hour, and in this. In this scenario with buyer's agents, I think that they will have probably shown them houses once, maybe twice, and then and yeah. say, hey, here's the agreement. Uh, you run through it. My fee is 3%. Um, if somebody asks, like, well, hey, Eric, do you ever come down on that commission? You know, uh, I'm going to buy in the next 60 days. That's a pretty expensive price point. W would you do it for 2%? Um, you have to make the decision pretty quickly and how they request the reduced commission is a big part of it. And I would say something to the effect of, well, why don't we meet in the middle of two and a half? And yeah, yeah, that's it, but that's good. But here's the thing I would say, and this, right. I'm not going to pick a number. What I'm saying right. is pick it before they talk to you. Pick it before they ask. Right. Like, have that in mind, because there's a certain point. Like, let's say the house is, I'm going to make up a number two. Oh, God. But now let's change the price to uh, 1.5 million. Right. right. And now it has the same question. Well, Yeah. And they've already, and they're, you've already established this will be someone practically fun to work with. I don't know that I would want to turn away a 10% debt. So oh. I don't want to make it. No, don't do that. Right. Uh, all I'm saying is sort of have it figured out in your head before you ever talk to the customer. Otherwise, you're making that decision 
under duress. And so I would just say, whatever your numbers are, you no know, different than how how you run your business. You're not going to wait if you, if you say, what are, the, what are the costs of being with your company? You can't have every agent come and work me a special deal. Well, no, you, you, can't, you can't run a business that way. Right. Any more than you could go into a grocery store and go, but I live near here. Can't you sell it to me for less? I'll buy apples every week. So, right. you, you, but you'd want to have some idea of what the rules are so that you're not constantly thinking it through. You're, 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 here's the thing. Most agents, if they, they have sort of a Pop-Tart, especially buyer agents. They have sort of a Pop-Tart mentality, like they're waiting for someone to go, come on, I want to see the house right now. And Zillow goes out of their way to enforce that on agents who want to get the leads. And they take 40% for making your life hell. Right. So I'm going, I just go, the simple solution is don't be business with Zillow. And so it, it's really, but there's lots of good customers. Like everyone who wants a house, it's a pretty obvious statement to us that the buyer is going to be better off in almost every case if they have their own advocate. Correct. I think that's a correct statement. It, well, I, I was I, told by that with, with good. I, everyone will always have a better experience with a good agent in their in yes. their, and and when you hear these awful complaints and when people are a bit concerned about oh will agents be around in 10 years it's because you hear these stories about bad agents but whenever you qualify yes. for a good they'll have an it's a it's just a true statement no matter who it is they'll have a better they'll have a better experience mm -hmm. with a good agent working for that yeah, and you know what makes a good agent you, you think i can tell you there's one characteristic that makes a good agent it's the same characteristics that makes a good parent. Let's go back to school teachers. In all of your education, you had one or two that stand out as like, oh my God, he or she, they, he was just amazing. They were such a wonderful teacher. They weren't necessarily the smartest. They weren't necessarily the most knowledgeable. But they had a quality that made them special as a teacher. They cared. Just that one thing. They cared. And it's that care factor that makes a good agent, like someone who actually gives a damn about their customers and shows it by whatever, by like helping the customer. Uh -huh. Because what's helpful to one buyer is not necessarily helpful to the next buyer. But literally, you'd have to look at what does this guy need? What does she need that would help her? And they, what they want is honesty. They want integrity. They want someone who won't try to hit them or take advantage of them. One time I went on a listing appointment, and the guy was, I think it was Vietnamese, but I wouldn't swear to it. Uh, he didn't speak English. That's what I know. And his daughter was, I think, 10 or 11. And when I got to the house, was, uh, they insisted on me eating dinner. Oh, well, I had to take, to take my shoes off. And the entire family sort of waited on me while I ate. They kept bringing me more food. And then the father would ask me questions. He would go, question, Shaw. And he would ask me a question. But he would then say to his daughter, because I'm telling you, she's 10 or 11 years old. She's a little girl. And then he would ask it to her in that language. I think it was Vietnamese. And then she would explain the question to me in English. Then I would answer the question to her in English. Then she would tell her dad what I said. And he kept giving me this question, Shaw. Up until the time he asked if someone made an offer, but they didn't complete the deal, could he think the earnest money? And I went, well, now that's going to depend. And so I say to the daughter, probably not, unless they acted in bad faith. And I had to explain to her, this is a kid now. Mm. Uh, the nuances of the only way he could get to keep the earnest money is if they had been approved for the loan and then didn't close. But if they didn't get approved for the loan or the house didn't appraise, I explain all this crap. He tells her, and then she tells her dad what I just said. And he goes, okay. And from that point, he wanted to know where he signed and how much I wanted to price his house at. He was checking me to see if I was honest. And once he could see I wasn't going to try to trick him, it was how much should his house sell for. Yeah. And now he knew I was on his side. And I think that one, the reason I'm saying that, I think that people want to be treated. You look at how you'd like to be treated, and then you, it's really easy then to go, well, this is what they, they just need to be nice and nice and answer their questions. 
And some everybody doesn't have the same set of questions. I think that the fascination agents have with commissions, it's different though. The public, you have people, I don't want to pay an agent. Okay, then do it yourself. I'm not going to make you pay someone. We're not, I'm not trying to trick anyone. Uh, we don't have, uh, you know, it's fine. You, you can do it yourself. There's a lot of stuff you can do yourself. I encourage people on that point to not pay a dentist. I consider with pliers and a screwdriver, there's very little I can't teach you to do. So, and it saves a lot of money. You could see, what I'm not trying to pick on, I'll let you but look what dentists charge. And I go, oh, no, let me show you some techniques. <laughs> so, so, to circle back to, to what we discussed in the very beginning, I mean, it, Mm -hmm. The fear that buyer's agents have is the what if, what if, what if our commission goes down? What if I have these hard conversations? And mm -hmm. as you said in the beginning, don't make any decisions while you're fearful, but, yes. but you need to make these business decisions. Now you need to think about what you will charge. It's not a, what if, right. you know, a, a, what if they ask me to. Uh, you know, to reduce my commission. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, as soon as you make that decision and stick with it, you, one, you're going to find out that a good majority of people, whenever you say, no, I, I don't do that, will say, okay, fine. I still will work with you. But those that, yeah. those that don't, um, you dodge the bullet, in my opinion. You know, if, if, if yes. it works. And that right there is the key. Like the guy, like let's pretend. It, it, here, here's the amount of commission that I recommend. But I mean this sincerely. Yeah. What's competitive in that marketplace? For example, in Los Angeles or in San Francisco, they don't talk about 6%. It's not, it hasn't been, when you're talking about an entry level home being around a million dollars for an entry level home, right. you would find four and a half to 5% being normal full, full amount of commission with a co broke involved. Right. That, that would, but when you get down, like, let's go to Ames, Iowa, I'd be shocked if they dropped much below 6%. Oh, I think you can find prices. My parents moved from a little tiny town in Oklahoma, and you would still see 65 and 7% sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Because the there prices are so much lower. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have to be competitive. And I think what everyone right. needs to, to understand is who's your competition? Is your competition. Right. You know, Redfin or the other discount brokers? No, I'm not really, no, not at all. The, the people that want discounted service and want to save money, they're going to go over there. And you don't compete mm -hmm. with that. And you can't, you can't offer full service, gray service. from no, these and they can't either, which is why yeah. they modeled. They started off acting like we're going to change the world. And now they've actually become a regular real estate company that just instantly loses money. Yeah. I want to send you. A, I want to send you a podcast. Uh, Mike Topretti had one of the uh, had one of the execs for Redfin on. Really smart guy. And there's a bunch of smart yeah. people work over there. Yes, uh, it, mm -hmm. it would not shock you, but it's still a bit satisfying to listen to how much he sounds like a traditional broker. He finished the podcast for the last ten minutes. He talked about a sphere of influence marketing. I was like, guys, yeah. you're, you're supposed to run yeah, yeah, yeah. the world oh. by charging everybody half a yeah. percent. Or what happened here? Now you're talking about. Because sending BS to your SOI, so like, yeah. he's done this there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's, that's what's happened. And that's what the Justice Department has never understood with the point right. you're making. The reason you have not had commissions dropping is not because of a conspiracy. It's because of the mechanics involved. Right. And so do I expect to see buyer commissions ever for anything below about 2%. No, Absolutely. I don't. I don't. Because otherwise, it'll just become an unprofitable thing for a buyer agent to do, and they won't do it. it it's just there's a certain point you go, I, I'm not doing this. I, I have to make a living. I try not to live in the hypotheticals and in the predictions because it definitely predict doesn't really matter other than, no. preparing, other than preparing for what's plausible and likely. Hell yeah. If I had to guess, I, I see them. We, if I did guess, we see some downward pressure on commission because yeah, yeah. they've not had discussed in the past. And as soon as you start discussing them, you will make exceptions for some people. Uh, using the yes. family member example, um, lots of folks will give a great deal to a family member on a listing. 
But then on the mm-hmm. black side, oh no, the solar page, it don't worry about it. And then now that yeah, we yeah, have, yeah. So you'll see some now numbers. they won't say that. Yeah. In our market, um, we're pretty fortunate. The percentage is high for a, for a high average price, but we average around 2.55 on the listing side. Land of commissions yeah. is dust all the time. My gut is we probably see it land somewhere around there. And you're absolutely right. You can't operate profitably below around 2%. You just can't do it. So I think right. that's where, I think if it'll sell somewhere in that range. So. And the proof of that, it really, and, and I'm not accusing them of anything other than being foolish, would be Red King. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it's not that I think they were dishonest or they're trying no. to trick people or if they're, they're lying. Or, I'm, not, I'm not even suggesting something like that. But they've been, they've been, been actors, which they've is been, a dumb idea. They've been up for 20 years and they can't turn a profit. And right. you know, going back to, to Mike's analysis, like he looks at all of the brokerages right now and, and none of them are turning profit. Even the high, even the highly efficient brokerages are still not turning a profit. And Reddit uh-huh. is the worst in terms of profitability. Yeah. I so, saw that. I just saw that. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't. He's just so not... smart. Mike Del Pret is so brilliant. It's just stunning. He, he's just really an amazing guy. Yeah. He's, he's, I think you'd love him. Um, really good guy. He's funny. He'll say, uh, when you, when you ask him his predictions or his opinion, he said, that's not interesting. I just have to look at the numbers and tell you what it is. He's very smart. And I would agree with him on that as well. Is there anything else? Does anyone there or anybody have any question they want to address anything? So I, you know, I'm, I apologize. We don't have more direct questions. I've talked with so many of our agents. I have a ton of notes right here that, that uh-huh. I don't know how to everything in us. I mean, you nailed it, and you and when we talked yesterday, I was asking you some direct questions, and you cut through right, right through everything, and got to the heart of it, and said, "Well, Eric, it's all fear." And so I think yeah. you, I think you nailed it that it's really just the fear of the unknown, the uncertainty, uh, you know, what's going to happen, and the advice mm-hmm. you gave. No, no surprise that the advice you gave just just nails it. Like, don't make any, don't make any decisions while you're fear, fearful. The binary, right. the binary decision right now is: Do you want to stay in the business or not? Right, I sure do. Yes, yeah. yes, me too. And that's the it, it. Just start with that. Are you are you going to be keep like if you're sitting? There, I don't mean you or me because I already know this is what I'm going to be doing, and I know it's for you. Well, I'm if somebody's out there thinking, I'm going to become say professional, again? Professional, professional snowboarder. That's my ultimate ultimate dream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, see you, but see once you're successful, you can go do what you want just because it's fun, well, it's and it doesn't have to be. No, the stuff the stuff I love is listening to music, but I don't get a like like I don't get a lot of job offers. Would you like to listen to music all day and have lunch with your friends? And uh, wouldn't that be a good career for you? Yeah, it actually is a great career, uh, but no one wants to pay me. In fact, I have to wind up paying for the lunch half the time, which makes it sickening to me. But 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 my but but all I'm saying is, you can the whole point of, of making money is to get to do what you want to do. Right. Seriously, to, to have enough that you don't have to worry about money. And it's not even that difficult. You just simply have what you're, it's like, you do not make a decision when you're low tone. Yeah, just yeah. don't. If you find yourself, like, I, I remember this sinking in for me, one of this wonderful guy, this was back in 1970-something, 77, and his name was Bill. And he was one of those people that, if I said he was a magnificent person and, and charismatic, that would be an understatement. And he got killed in a car accident. And everybody I knew around him just, we did, we, he was loved, to, to, to put it mild. And I remember his sister, who I'm still good friends with, Carol, and she said something to the effect, I'm never going to be happy again. This was right after Bill died. And I said, honey, uh, I don't think that's what Bill would want for you. And I just kept telling her, if you really want to honor him, it won't be with a viewpoint like that. That's not, he, he would not have agreed to that for you. you know, that's the only point I'm making here. Because to make a decision, I, I guess that one was so stu- obviously stupid. I'm never going to be happy again. And I thought, well, there's a dumb one. And she's a friend. And she's a, if you knew her, you'd go, she's really loved. She's a delightful person. So immediately it's go, no, you can't have that viewpoint. I'm not going to let you. And, and so when you get that kind of thing, like there's some ideas if somebody says, I'm going to be a millionaire. Great. Decide you are one and start behaving like that. Mm-hmm. I'm serious. 
not by squandering money, just mock it up. That's how you become one. You, you literally go, like you have that uh, Tesla plant. You could decide, I want, I'm going to have a Tesla plant. You can have anything you want. You get the idea. You could have whatever. Somebody says, I want a whatever. Okay, get one. It, the, the whole point of, if you, if you do enough business, you could get whatever you wanted and, uh, and comfortably afford it. Where it's not like, oh my God, now I paid this for that. It doesn't matter. And the whole point is make enough. Right. But if you're in fear or anger, like let's say you get mad about something. I'm, I'll never be friends with her again. Well, that's your wife, sir. That's not, you understand? Like, yeah. that's just not a good viewpoint. Don't make a decision that matters when you're low toned. Anger, fear, grief, apathy, that's not the time. Wait till you're in cheerfulness and it doesn't have a grinness to it. Then decide. The That's last awesome. time, the, the first time that uh, you met Max and the three of us got to talk for a little over an hour, uh-huh. it is crazy. I love meeting with you because we never really, we, we sex was a topic, but then we, we uh-huh. talked about stuff. Everything revolved around mindset. And mm-hmm. at the time, it was when the market has shifted and everyone was fearful about, you know, what's happening, how am I going to make it through this? And, you know, we talked about how mindset was the most important thing. Yes, I, you know, I think that's the case, and that's the case here as well. Um, all that I think that mindset allows you to focus on what will improve your business so that you can yes. make as much money as you want in order to do whatever it there is. You go. Uh, there you go. There you well, go. I love yeah. doing this, and we can do it whenever you want. And, and you, you have said you're surrounded by wonderful people because you're a wonderful person, and this is the truth. And and so uh, you attract. It was sort of like funny. When I was uh, Phil Sexton, I, I've yeah. known Phil for a long time, and I just knew when I when I found out you guys were both going to see my girlfriend, I went, I was like, I I thought well, you guys are going to just literally hit it off immediately, because he's like like you, he's smart, he's got an amazingly good sense of humor, yes, and he's such a such a nice person, yeah. Uh, it, it, but I would say all of everything I would say about Phil, I could say I could say the same thing. I could describe both of you with the same adjectives and say my time, which is really important. It's, <laughs> I, you're an amazing human being, Russ. And every, I mean, trust me. When, when I met Phil, loved him immediately, and you were a a topic of conversation more than once. So I obviously loved you. So um, oh. thank you for this. You've done I mean, you've yes. helped me so much in my business. I'm really happy to see. If you're able to help our agents as well, and other folks, and, and you're so great. glad. So, thank you so much. Have well, a cool. beautiful day, buddy. You too. Hey, I'm going to, uh, so you're going to time you go to Phoenix and, uh, three of us can grab dinner. Yeah, I think that would be, that would be fantastic. Awesome. Thanks so love much. Bye bye. See you, man. Take bye. care. I love you too, man. Bye. Bye bye.